Joining us now, the author of a brand new book, I Used to Like You Until. She is also one of the stars of Gutfeld. It is Kat Temp on The Will Kane Show. Hey, Kat. Hey, how are you? Good. Is that right? Video games, one of the most unattractive things men can do as a hobby? I was nodding along the whole time you were saying that. Yeah, my experience, unfortunately, comes from having dated a man who was into video games and one singular man because I never did it again. Just the thought of just picture that you're sitting there, you're being ignored while he's wearing a headset and like fighting a fake battle. So now I I married a man who fought in an actual war. So I... <laughs> Much more attractive uh, to, to be <laughs> I would imagine. an actual veteran than uh, a Call of Duty playing man. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to think, and I think we're going to do this in the third segment here today of the Wilkes. I'm trying to think what else is up there. Like if you're ranking your five most unattractive hobbies, um, and this is from the ladies out there. Um, because I know if I want to get like hero status on the internet, on social media, I should go to battle with you right now. I should defend the dudes out there playing college football right. 25, but I recognize I'm capable of stepping back and going, even if I were in the moment doing it. Yeah, this is not, this is not attractive. What else is on the list though, Kat? Like as you walk in the room, what's the unattractive hobby? I mean, that so that to me is is honestly I, I agree with it being like number one because of the way that guys generally aren't into video games just a little bit. It's often <laughs> and then he'll turn it around on you where it's like, you don't understand that I just need time for myself. It's like that's one that's really one hell of a way to spend nine hours unshowered, you know, on your couch eating Doritos. But I think also just anything similar. Like the guys that are really into those weird fantasy board games is also kind of gross. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I don't Here's, want, ideally, oh, I want to be the hobby. I want, I want to be, you know, I can't wait to see you. I love you so much, but I'm, I, I'm not trying to say I'm not a nightmare in my own way. Cause of course I am, but. Ann Bretrick says on YouTube, watching a man, um, house cleaning does it for me so i don't think she, she's saying it's one of the more attractive hobbies so i'll just i'll, I'll run one by you maybe one of my i'm not going to call it an insecurity but when i do it i do wonder i was um <laughs> i was my wife and i were with another couple of night and i went into their backyard we sat down in their backyard to have a drink and i was like hey marnie are those hydrangeas over there i really i really like that uh I notice landscaping. I like landscaping. I think a manicured yard looks good. And I, I'm curious, and I'm not an expert. I wish I was like, what's that tree? What's this tree? What's that? So I'm just kind of, I'm curious and interested. I would not say I'm a green thumb or I plant, but every time I do, I'm a little bit like, is that masculine? Landscaping? I think landscaping is. So my husband, he's actually very into like he's a little too into it because we don't have we don't have a yard. But what he'll do is he'll watch lawnmower videos. He'll watch videos <laughs> of someone mowing a lawn. I guess it's uh, he would love nothing more than to just leave this all behind and be like a dude who landscapes in the Midwest somewhere. Uh, but unfortunately that's, that's not where our life is right now. He really does. He wants to be, he wants to be like a blue collar landscaping man. Uh, so I think that's his way of, of kind of pretending for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's Cutting okay. grass is therapeutic. Yeah. Dudes, yeah. dudes take pride in, in their grass. That's, that's uh, not to say that I don't out, start issues that I don't start. Like, that's not to say that, like, if I see him watching that when I'm in the room, that I don't I don't make it a problem because I do, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you can watch that uh, when I'm not. When there's not a beautiful woman in the room. Yeah, I, I wish you a long and happy marriage, Kat, <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of landscaping videos in your future um yeah. it's not always going to be attention for you something i think you already know um you have a new book out called i used to like you until and i want to get into the some of that but the book in large part through personal stories as well is you 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 talk a lot about non-binary thinking and it's worth saying you know you talk about binary thinking through a lot of different prisms so religious prism political prism um and I think it's worth analyzing this instinct, 
probably an instinct that we all have to reduce things into um, to binary choices. Um, I want to come back to it in just a moment, but I want to kind of start with something in the news because I think it applies, and that's RFK. And yeah. there's this talk of RFK dropping out of the race. And the betting market swung to Trump. And I'm a little surprised by that. I guess we always kind of wondered who does he pull more from? Does he pull more from from first Biden, now Harris? Or does he pull more from Trump? And right now it's looking like, shockingly, he pulls more from Trump because with him out, more, more of the vote swings to Trump. What do you think about this third party guy, RFK, and, and him potentially dropping out of the race and his support going to Trump? So I think a, a reason that a lot of that, that doesn't surprise me about his support going to Trump, because I think a lot of people, what they really like about him is a lot of the things he's had to say about COVID. And I actually don't think it's the specific things that he says so much as he said things that weren't the allowed things to say, whether people agree with the specific things that he says or not. I know people will be like, oh, I think he's kind of kooky on this or that. But I was if you I mean, it wasn't that long ago that people's real life relationships were destroyed over these people veering outside of the acceptable lane of thought on covid and this stuff that was, I mean, I don't know, most of these conspiracies now turned out to be not conspiracies at all. And there were really tangible things that people lost. I mean, people lost businesses, people couldn't say goodbye to loved ones, and people lost relationships over things that turned out to be lies anyway. And I that's why I do think, honestly, that being, everyone does it, right? Everybody has preconceived notions. It's human to have preconceived notions. But I think that it's really healthy and it makes you a smarter, more well-rounded, cre more creative, more perceptive person to acknowledge that and, and willingly try to look out, look outside of that and see if what you think is just because of certain pressures or what you think and why you think it. So, as I mentioned, you you take this idea of non-binary thinking and you and you bring it through the prism of religion and politics. But I think maybe the most interesting to me is also just our personal relationships become very yeah. binary. And mm -hmm. um, this is from some of the some of the talking points and experts from your book. But I'm going to read this. We write people off unnecessarily. We miss out on personal relationships that could have been fulfilling. Um, for example, someone you might disagree with on guns might have a parent suffering from the same illness or no good lawyer who can keep you out of jail. You know, Kat, this, I spent five years. You and I actually knew each other before I went to ESPN and before I did sports. We knew each other at National Review. So I was in yeah. this world. I left this world and went to sports, and now I've come back to this world. And I will say one of my favorite things about five years in sports was, yeah, you stopped. I'm never going to pretend like it's not in there and not part of the conversation. Oh, he's liberal. Oh, he's conservative. Oh, she's this. He's that. But... There were so many other touch points at which you could relate to somebody. And I, the most obvious one was sports. Like, what do you think of the Cowboys? What do you think of this? And, and it makes people more dimensional, which we are. And it makes yeah. people more interesting. And I do think that is a healthier, and maybe it is how most Americans live their life anyway. You know, um, my five years in sports put me back in touch with America and how they, because what you and I do is very much in the bubble of thinking things about politics often. But America has gravitated into that bubble of losing the depth of the person you're interacting with and seeing not how you disagree, but all the commonalities. Yeah. I, I, and I, and you know, I'm someone who's independent and so it's very rare. Actually, it's never happened for me to find someone who is I'm aligned with on everything. I have a lot of friends that are conservative, but they don't love Trump. I have a lot of friends that are super MAGA, love Trump. I have friends that are very left wing. I have friends that are disengaged from it. And all of these relationships are relationships that I'm very, very grateful for. And I, I think that there's also this fear. I think that there is a fear of expressing an opinion outside of whatever your team is. If you're seen as, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm conservative or, oh, I'm liberal. Out of a very real fear, I think, of being ostracized by that group. Because I think as divided as we are, to your point, we're not still as divided in our, in our minds and reality than we see portrayed, not just in the media, but also in our conversations with each other. What's interesting as well, you live in New York. I don't remember where you're from, Kat, but you're not from New York City. Yeah, I'm from um, the Detroit area. I met your dad yeah. one time. 
I remember, My dad, I remember yeah. I met your dad in, in the lobby. Um, I lived in New York for 15 years, and that meant, obviously, that I had a lot of friends who were liberal. The majority of my friends were liberal because I lived in New York. It's just that's the world. That's the bubble, <laughs> right? Um, I will say this, Kat, and I'm not – I don't want to do a tit for tat or I don't want to try to make – I don't want to otherize, but I do think and, – and, and acutely – since Donald Trump, that I think that many on the left use it as their primary identity. So you're, mm-hmm. what you and I are talking about is there's so much more to your identity than your politics. But even though I had those friends, and I, I'm still friends with a lot of them, and I think I would say this, often socially, I felt an undercurrent of judgment. Like there's a judgment to whatever is going on or what I might think about something that is about how we differ politically. And that didn't define the relationship 100%. There were other, our kids, our sports, whatever it may be. But I do think that the left has, has draped themselves in their political identity as their primary identity a little more than the right. I live in Dallas now, mm-hmm. and I do think I have some, some um, I think I can compare it. I don't yeah. think it's as extreme on, on the right. I really don't. I'm not saying it's not there, but I don't think it's as extreme as their primary identity. I think so. I think, first of all, that you're correct, that I think it's gotten worse um, in terms of people getting broken by Donald Trump. I'm I'm someone that have has oh, I've, my beliefs have been the same. I'm small government across the board. So sometimes it places me at odds with people on either side. Um, but I had a friend who was a very close friend of mine who suddenly it was a problem. The things that I'd always believed because Trump was running and all that mattered was that Trump lost. I hadn't changed, um, but all of a sudden things were different. And this is a very close friend that is no longer in my life anymore because it became where we'd be out just trying to have like a social event. And he'd be like, oh, how are you going to, you know, be talking about the I had the libertarian candidate at the time, Joe Jorgensen, on my comedy advice show, Sincerely Cat, R.I.P. Uh, I had her on that show that I had at the time. And I wasn't even allowed like in his mind to do that because how could I be giving a platform to her right now? Meaning the time when Trump must be defeated, uh, defeated above all else. But I think I've also gotten it from people who, if I'm critical of Trump, people will come after me, call me a traitor, say that. And, and again, I've never claimed to be a Republican, which is why it's so funny when I'm called a rhino. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm independent. I've never claimed to be a Republican either. But I think that you really, really, really nailed it when you say that for people it can become their identity. And I think something else that I write about in the book is there's this study and it's very obvious, uh, but moral outrage is more often uh, rooted in self-interest than altruism. It can make you feel like you're doing something to help these problems when you are really not doing anything at all. And I think the perfect example of that is, you know, what we saw even at the convention, the Democratic convention that's happening this week, which is I'm the good team. And so therefore, just by you're the bad team, Trump is dangerous, as Obama said, Trump is dangerous. And he talked a lot about division being bad. And I agreed with that, but I don't see how calling Trump dangerous really helps achieve those ends, right? Um, then you get to be good just by very virtue of not being on that bad team. And I think that can be really hard for people to give up because then it's like, oh, wait, I'm not just good because of the box that I check when I vote or because I'm not a Republican. Well, then you have to think about actually getting out there and doing something. That's a lot harder. That's really good. Moral outrage is more about self-interest than it is about altruism. Mm-hmm. That is a very... um that it's a very flowery and accurate way, I think, of explaining what we've all kind of used shorthand, virtue signaling, right? What you're doing is draping yourself in virtue by having the right opinion. And I've said, and I don't want to spend the the bulk of our conversation being like, and the left is bad too, you know, but um, I think that for much of the left, your vote has become, the ballot box has become your church and your vote has become your act of penance or your, or your charity, that you're a good person because you went into the voting booth and checked the right box to your point, or even less, just expressed the right outrage on social media or even in your social circles, that you become a good person. Um, I think that is definitely something indicative of the left. Now, this is not, I don't want to do this to say everything on the right is right, you know, but 
but I do think this binary thinking that you're talking about on a personal level has really, really inhabited the left. See, I, I, I and 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 I definitely understand. I, I I get it from both sides, and I'll and I explain it in the book this way, where I will have you know viewers of Fox, and and this is not all viewers, right? I I have I'm on tour. I sell out shows. These are Fox people coming to these shows. A lot of the audience is awesome, but there are of course those exceptions of people that are like she made fun of Trump, or she's you know she's not a re- she's not a registered Republican, or she votes third party, therefore she's my enemy. And and they'll give me those things. On the other side, though, there are people who are on the left who will not speak to me at all just because I work at Fox News. So it doesn't matter what I say. And but what, real quick, Kat, yeah. and I, the difference in in those two groups of people that that I that I notice though is the people who require you to be predictable. Right? I used to like you until the right. people who on the right who who require you to not deviate from anything they agree are honestly strangers. They're, they're audience, and you are a personality to them, at least the way you're describing it to me right now. And the people who on the left who are ostracizing you because of your views are supposed to be the ones that already know you on a deeper level and understand those vulnerabilities or understand the, the, the layers of you, of you as a human being. And I guess that's the difference. I do think the right is guilty of it, but I haven't had many friends on the right ever go, well, Will, you disagreed with me in this way, and therefore we're not friends. And the left, it seems to be more willing to exercise personal relationships because of politics. I, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. If we, if we, if I, if I, if I can also get just get really deep and probably too personal right now, but it's in the yeah. book, so whatever. I have experienced that with religion as well. I've had experienced personal relationships where I'm I'm no longer religious. And that's created some rifts in family relationships. I I get really deep into the relationship with my mom, who's been dead for 10 years, which not because it was easy. But for me, I'm somebody who I know that I would be happier if I were religious. So I'm the I'm the opposite of judge religious people. I know I would be happier. I personally can't get there. But this is another thing where. Um, and I, and I actually, I'm not, I'm not closing that door. I hope to get there someday. So it's actually, it's actually more than just that. I, that I wish I could. Um, but I think that the, the key here is, is to be willing to talk to people, um, to, I have many, many close friends who are very, very religious people who are not judgmental people. I think that this country was founded on individual rights. And I think the more that we could get back to, you know, respecting individual rights, that would be better. Um, and, 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 but I, sadly, I think we go more and more towards this idea, uh, in, in the opposite direction where you kind of have to fall in line. Um, I, I really think that the key is communicating with each other more. And I really think the key is being willing to have those, those conversations and not shutting each other out. Um, and I'm willing to put myself so, out there. So, <laughs> and you have, you have in, I uh, used to like you until, and I know you've got to go in just a moment. I just want to share two thoughts with you before you go. So. When it comes to the other two areas that of of binary thinking that you that I mentioned that you talk about, uh, one is politics, and we can talk about this on another occasion. I don't like partisanship, cat. I don't consider myself on a team. I like to think that I'm a critical thinker. I also think it's interesting that we have to think about over the last ten years how those two teams, those two bipolar teams in politics, have really changed their underlying policies. And I don't know if that should make us cynical or hopeful um, to the binary system. I don't know the I honestly do not know yet what I think about that. But on the religious front, um, I'll be interested in continuing to know you. And what I mean by that, and I don't mean to be patronizing or I'm older than you, but I I mean, I I think I've said this to my audience or I hope, you know, I I lost, I lost my religion for a while. I mean, I, I lost faith and I know why. And it was a lack of humility for me. It was too much hubris and too much intellectualism and, and these types of things. I know you're going to have a child soon, and which is awesome. Yeah, by and I'm the not way, saying I'm that'll be the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for and me, I, it was. I'm trauma. not saying that'll be the thing that changes it, <laughs> but it could be the thing that changes it. I don't think religion, as someone who has come around you, like you said, you're open to it. And by the way, I always was as well. I wasn't dogmatic. Yeah. I was always open. Um, yeah, not it's not atheist, bipolar. Not I don't think it's I'm a question mark. So, and that's what I would have described myself. And I just think actually getting beyond strict bipolar thinking and just being open-minded and open-hearted is what led me back to seeing that it's the path to a greater purpose. And maybe it will find, maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't, but I don't, I will say, I don't think I got there 
because I joined a team or it was bipolar. Yeah. But I was not just critically thinking, but critically open to something that I think is ultimate truth. Yeah. And I'm still open. And, and I, you know, I've, I'm always open to changing as a person, you know, and, and, and as I learn new information and even I, I make very excited to be a mom, uh, which is never a sentence that I thought I would say in my entire, and again, you've <laughs> known me for a long time. So you know how true that is, uh, that I'm ex- I'm four months pregnant. I can't wait to be a mom. And as much as I tease my husband, he's truly the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm really excited. Um, for, for this I, I know like next chapter sounds so cheesy but it is i mean it's my life is about to completely change and i, and I can't wait it's gonna be awesome as long as he gives <laughs> up video games uh <laughs> all right you guys should go get her book it's, it's i used to like you until it's the newest book from cat tim as she said she's vulnerable she's thinking through these things open-minded and critically and applies it to all aspects of life i think you'll really enjoy it i used to like you until cat tim thank you so much for being on the will Kane show great seeing you